reason that we're here is that as one of the themes that has come up across the conference is what are the things that are possible when you begin combining the world of wisdom and tradition, the world of science and the world of technology. And the way that these things can come together and the possibilities that they bring are very interesting. And so I wanted to start off before we talk a little bit about the work we've been doing uh, by uh, asking Jimpa and Dacker, what is it that calls to them about this work? Um, <clears throat> someone who has been um, involved for a long time in the capacity of um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's principal interpreter, um, involved in Mind and Life Institute, where our main objective is to bring science and the contemplative insights and tradition uh, together to really um, kind of uh, relate to the larger question of elevation of human suffering and promotion of happiness. And this particular forum is very attractive because, in a sense, it's bringing another important voice and partner, you know, in, the, in this mission, which is the technology, particularly the digital technology, which is so ubiquitous and so pervasive in our contemporary life. So um, I don't know how the three of them will actually this kind of marriage will lead, whether this is going to be a happy marriage or a, a complicated one like many marriages. But I think at least the idea of this is very inspiring. And uh, I must actually let me take the opportunity to comment uh, Soren for this wonderful vision and creating this platform. And uh, I was fortunate and honored to be participant last year. And this year, I'm so impressed that actually it has, you know, sort of increased threefold. And last year, there were a couple of hundred um, attendees, and this year, much larger. And this is very, very encouraging and inspiring because it shows that there is a real aspiration. And this morning, someone talked about aspirational as a key word. And it's for me, someone who has been in this world, uh, particularly in my capacity as, as the Dalai Lama's interpreter, this is very uh, inspiring, encouraging. Um, well, I'd like to thank Arturo because that's why I'm here. Uh, I was giving a talk down at Stanford, and before the talk, with my nerves rattling, I went to the bathroom, and Arturo came up to me, uh, not in any inappropriate way. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, so you study the science of compassion, and I was mumbling and trying to hold myself together. And he said, would you like to make Facebook more compassionate? And in the social and biological sciences, that is an incredibly interesting question, which is, how do you take this really complicated system of a billion people and build in little memes and ideas and principles of communication to make it more compassionate? And that was one reason. Uh, a second reason is I think that the, the spirit that you feel in this, this auditorium is really uh, reflecting a pendulum swing. And what we've seen in the last 30 years, and this is well documented in the social sciences, is that uh, children and teens and people a little bit younger than myself have seen declines in empathy, declines in compassion, increases in self-focus and narcissism and materialism, all poor for our health. And so why not be engaged in a system that can sort of correct those trends? And, and it was uh, too good an offer to, to pass up. Um, and so with that, if we can bring the slides up. Um, slide, okay. Uh, so we wanted to talk about uh, what it is that we're learning. And as you look at your experience here in the conference, look at the connections that you make. Because I can say that a lot of what we're going to talk about originated two years ago uh, here, where I was a, a somewhat reluctant attendant. And uh, to hear John and Jack talk about, you know, if, if, if people really saw each other, if people really heard each other, if people really met each other, they would be kinder to each other. And that something in the back of my head kind of clicked and went, like, we, we need to, we have a responsibility to facilitate this conversation and this communication. And out of that began seeking out uh, partners with which to do uh, the work. And uh, back then? So um, when we thought about building compassion into Facebook, what we're really doing is honoring not only the principles of wisdom in His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, one of my favorite quotes of his is, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you would like to be happy, practice compassion. But I think we're actually honoring one of the basic design principles in human evolution, which is our tendency towards cooperation and sympathy. Uh, Charles Darwin was a beloved father. 
uh, rated by historians of science as one of the most kind-hearted scientists that's walked the face of the earth. And he arrived at this idea about sympathy that has in part guided this work with Facebook, uh, in part through grieving the loss of his beloved daughter who died at the age of 12. And Darwin said that its sympathy will have increased through natural selection for those communities which included the greatest number of most sympathetic members will flourish best and raise the greatest number of offspring. Sympathy and compassion are built into our DNA. Now, when Arturo approached me, there's this, this fascinating challenge, right? I've been, for 25 years, I've been locked up in laboratories coding more facial expressions than any human being alive and doing preposterous amounts of work in this science. Uh, and what Arturo is really asking is, how do we take systems of communication that have been evolving for tens, if not hundreds of millions of years, building the muscles of the face and the voice, and how do we get that wisdom into online communication? That is an incredibly interesting design challenge. What we know, the facial anatomy, similar to chimpanzees, is there to help communicate emotion. This drawing here of the vocal apparatus, we have sounds by which we communicate remarkable emotions all the time around the world and to build those principles into more, a more compassionate Facebook. I'm going to test this audience and let's see how well you guys do. At the count of three, I want you to emit a sound, no words, you can't utter your lover's name, uh, of compassion. One, two, three. Uh, very nice. All right, let's try a harder one. I can't, can't help myself. I'm collecting data. Uh, how about awe or reverence? One, two, three. There you go. We see these around the world, and so part of our challenge is to take this scientific wisdom and build it into compassionate communication at Facebook. Now, the door that led us down this path is we're getting lots of photos getting reported for these categories that we have. We have these categories that have hate speech, harassment, violence, drug use, and then we would head a photo like that uh, submitted for hate speech, and we didn't understand what was going on until we realized that the person that was reporting the photo was in the photo. And in most cases, the photo had been uploaded by one of their friends. And so we began down this path where we said, okay, let's ask Backer, can you, can you please take the photo down? And we put up an empty message box where I could tell Backer if he could take the photo down and only 20% of people would send that message. And it's really hard to tell your friends to do that. And then I began meeting the scientists that talk about compassion, how when you pick up that somebody's experiencing an emotion, you're more likely to want to help. So we did a little priming and we said, um, do you not want others to see you in this photo? Um, like, what is it about this photo that you don't like? And have these options like, it's embarrassing, asking people how they feel. And then we gave them a message that said, Hey, Decker, uh, there's something about this photo that's a little bit embarrassing to me. I don't want others to see it. Would you please take it down? And the really extraordinary thing we found in doing this is whereas only 20% of people would be willing to send a message in the first place, once you had this emotion-rich message, that went up to 60% of people wanting to send the message. But my favorite number in this part of the work is we asked the person who received the request. And remember, this is somebody who just shared something with all of their friends in the room, and then one of their friends raised their hand and went like, you know, that made me pretty sad. We asked them, how is it that you, how do you feel about your friend that made this request? And we got 65% positive and 25% neutral. So 90% of your friends, contrasted against that 20% that would only send a message, 90% of your friends want to know that they have done something, in most cases unintentionally, to upset you. So as we built in this emotion-rich language into these problematic conversations at Facebook, uh, this is really built on some just 20, 30 years of, of really important science. We know communicating emo emotion uh, expresses feelings. We know that when I signal vulnerability or a sense of suffering or a sense of uh, consternation on, uh, to another person. We know that that is a, one of the most powerful triggers of empathy. Um, we know that just building an emotion-rich language gives us insight. Uh, Aristotle wrote a lot about how language and drama and artistic portrayals help us gain this wonderful clarity about our emotions. 
Uh, so there were some really clear science-based principles to guide this work. Um, can we go back to the video now? Um, so what I wanted to do is now is I wanted to kind of open up the conversation and ask uh, from a wisdom and tradition perspective and from a science perspective. We all have questions for each other, so it's, it's cool. Um, from, from a wisdom tradition uh, perspective and a science perspective, what is it about how people relate to each other that if it was understood and communicated and put into practice would make the world a better place? Um, well, uh, I'm supposed to represent the wisdom. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, uh, at least I have the hair color to go with it. Um, um, this morning we heard a lot about, uh, from the various speakers, the importance for human beings to communicate, to connect. Um, from, um, if you look at the contemplative insights and traditions, um, one of the things that the contemplative traditions universally emphasize is being able to find your own space. Once you are able to find your own space, or sometimes it's referred to as the ground or groundedness, then you are in a much more healthy and stronger position to relate to others in a more efficient and um, kind of constructive manner. Because normally what happens is that because you are engaging with others from a more disturbed, restless state of mind, the interaction and engagement with others get really colored by that emotion. So one of the things that... The, the spiritual traditions, the contemplative traditions can really bring into our engagement with the digital technology. And this is something that I do care a lot about, partly for selfish reason, because I have two teenage daughters. Um, the elder one is just turned 16, and the younger one is turning 14 soon. And especially for the younger one, uh, Facebook is a very important world. And uh, we recently gave her, for her Christmas present, and um, iPod 5, which is this, this very slim, beautiful. And my elder daughter started teasing her, saying that her world, her sister's world, has now shrunk into this tiny <laughs> thing. So it's something that I do care a lot about. And one thing that I come to recognize is that one of the perhaps the most important elements that we can, every, each one of us can really take from the wisdom of the spiritual mm -hmm. contemplative traditions is the need for mm -hmm. two things. One is being able to set your own conscious intention, you know, motivation. The second one is being able to bring awareness into the moment. So whatever you're doing, if you're able to bring awareness, and that awareness, application of the awareness, for a lot of people at the initial stage may require stepping back, whether it takes the form of simply taking a deep breath, because what happens is that often we get so caught up in what life throws at you, we just get completely taken over as if we are being swept away by a tide. But the contemplative traditions explain to us that in order to, in order to really engage, you first need to take a step back. And that may involve simply doing a taking a breath. And then once you're able to do that, then you are able to bring awareness. And when you bring awareness, you become a lot clear about what you are doing, and then you are able to, with that kind of clarity, then you are able to bring your own values to connect with what you are doing. So I think here, it's not simply a question of connection. We do connect with people, and we do interact, but it is kind of a more constructive, healthy, you know, authentic connection and interaction that we seek. And here, I think, the kind of age-old contemplative insights of ensuring the purity of our own intention mm -hmm. and then being able to somehow bring awareness into what we are doing, I think will really have a huge uh, impact because at the end, whatever beautiful technologies we may have, in the end, the responsibility really lies on the part of the individual who is using the technology. And the technology is not going to tell us how we are supposed to use it from a moral, spiritual point of view. In the end, we as individuals need to proactively engage with the technology. Um, well, I'd like to ask Jimpa a question, but I, I feel that one of the things that, that the new social media give us, uh, and I see this with my daughters, who uh, one being a little bit more introverted is, is something that we now know from science is one of the great protectors and sources of resilience when we face the stresses of 
daily living, which is a sense of social connection and a social community. Uh, the networks that are created in the new social media will give our next generation, uh, it will rebuild that sense of social community. And we know from the work of people like Alyssa Eppel and Steve Cole, whom you heard earlier today, that that sense of social interconnectedness or embeddedness is one of the strongest predictors of, of avoiding the costs of stress. Um, one of the things that we've been grappling with in this design project at Facebook is, is how to make people more aware and more compassionate and kinder and building in little moments during the exchange where they reflect on their actions. And I, and I wanted to get some advice from you, Jimpa. I remember on a panel, you were with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and you, and you made this really fascinating observation that stuck with me, which is that the basic setting of the mind is compassionate. And I want to ask you if you feel that we can find those basic settings of the mind when we're in the new social media and on the internet. <laughs> um, this is a very, very um, difficult question, actually. Um, my own sense is that, you know, as some of the speakers this morning pointed out, that we do need to get back, you know, turn inwards first yeah. to really have that transitional period, kind of, you know, space yeah. to be able to connect with what is good inside us. I think it's very difficult to switch our modes of states of mind like that, you know, from a very disturbed state to completely switching to a more positive state. That's a very difficult one. Yeah. We need that kind of transition. So that may require, you know, whether it's a breathing or whatever techniques. So until we're able to do that, I think it's very difficult to really connect with that compassionate kind of natural um, part of our mind. I mean, there are situations, for example, like, you know, we may be, you know, completely in a disturbed or distracted state of mind, and then all of a sudden, right there in front of us, you know, uh, someone gets, you know, knocked over by a car. We see, yeah. you know, acute suffering. In those kind of situations, we really can feel powerful connections because, you know, acute suffering is so powerful connector. I mean, there's a reason why in Buddhism, the sentient beings, the definition of sentient beings is an organism that is capable of experiencing pain. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, Buddhism recognizes that our capacity to pay, feel pain is the most fundamental defining part of our nature. So there are situations like this, but ideally, we wouldn't, you know, want to depend upon those kind of stimulus to, you know, switch on what is beautiful in us. So that, this is where I think some, having some kind of contemplative practice as part of your daily makeup is very helpful because the idea here is you are learning to become more in touch with what is naturally within us right. so that we can then respond to situations from that space and, and place. So one question I have for you, Arturo, is um, you remember last year after the Mind, uh, Wisdom 2.0, we had some conversation. And, you know, one of the things that I, and maybe yeah, I'm being very idealistic, you know, I always tend to believe in the, the, the good part of human nature. And, um, and I've often wondered, you know, for example, when you look at the Google search, it's aesthetically very beautiful. There's just a tiny... You know, Google symbol, and there is a line, and I've often wondered why they wouldn't take the opportunity or, or the, the, the kind of privilege they have to have a nice byline on the top that would inspire people, that would really prime people. Uh, because one of the things that we learn from the world's spiritual traditions is that we, you know, sometimes secular people who are very deeply secular feel religious people who do a lot of prayers as being silly. But there's a reason why we say the same prayer every single day, because it's a sort of a reminder. You know, it's, you, you have a special connection, it resonates with you, and we are very susceptible to these kind of priming. So I was wondering for Facebook, because from your personal experience, we know that, you know, instead of asking people to choose to respond to someone saying, can you take that down, if you provide set language, you know, the, 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 it, it increases. And then also by designing more compassionate communication, then people are able to make the request in such a way that it has nothing to do with the other person. You're not blaming. You're talking about your own personal discomfort. That also makes the communication and interaction a lot more compassionate. So I was wondering whether 
you know, in, in Facebook, um, is it possible to, you know, take this more seriously and say, for example, if you open your Facebook page, there could be an opportunity where there could be some kind of line, a primer, <laughs> that would sort of make people become more aware and connect with what is good inside. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too <laughs> idealistic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, th I think in, in my experience in this space, there isn't such a thing as too idealistic, so um, it's all good. Uh, so we have actually been uh, playing with, and when you put in a status update, asking, how are you feeling today? And uh, a good friend of ours put elated, and that was the only thing, and he said that was the thing he had put on the most, that got the most comments and feedback of anything he had posted. Uh, so I think there is a lot to be said uh, for priming. Um, but I think the other question that sort of comes up for me on that is um, we we're talking about how can you do good as a corporation or within the context of a business. And I think that the interesting question to explore for anybody who's in that space is how can you build it into the product in a way that it just it's to the service of a particular need. And so we're starting from this point of, of people that have this need. They have the need to have the photo taken down. And, and we're trying to fulfill that need by helping people see each other. Because one of the things that we're learning from, from both wisdom and, and science on this is that the mechanisms that we have to help somebody know that something is sad, and which makes for a very short conversation in person, they get a little bit lost when you're on your phone. They're a little bit lost when you're like writing an email where all of your attention is on what you're needing and what you're feeling. And so one of the interesting, I think, ideas to explore has to do with how can you actually take your attention, not just from where you are, but also to the other person and what it is that they need and where they're coming from? Because we're finding in the responses to the message of asking to take the photo down, there's this wonderful variety that goes from, you know, I think you look beautiful in the picture. I, I'm sorry that you feel this way. Of course, I'll take it down. To, you know, it's really important for me and my grandmother. And so I think that in this context of helping people see each other and relate to each other better, there's a practice there that helps engender compassion. And if we can make that intrinsic to what we're building, mm -hmm. then we can hopefully do a lot of good that way. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So Arturo, your son is soon to join Facebook. A couple of years. What are, what are some of the primary experiences you hope to help design that he will have on Facebook? Um, to know when to put it down and go talk to their friends. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually building that in. It's like, it's time to pick up the phone. <laughs> um, but I think that the other one is, uh, so we're coming to learn that when you have somebody that's a teenager, you have to use different language to relate to them. Yeah. Something that might be report as an adult. When you're a teenager, you think you're going to get your friends in trouble. Yeah. So to say this is a problem is a big deal. To be able to say somebody said mean things about me is a deal. And I think that one of the things that we try to do is try to go to the person and understand what it is that they need and what is the language that most identifies with that need. And we have found this very interesting change in results every time that we try to apply that language. Wonderful. Um, but I wanted to... Let me ask a question to uh, Dakar. Um, you know, I mentioned to you before we were on the back. Um, once I was driving in, in Canada and I uh, switched on the radio and there was this wonderful hour-long uh, interview conversation with you uh, by one of the Canadian journalists and um, did I play the guitar uh, actually you did <laughs> no. um, and uh, I think it was soon after the book that came out which was called uh, born to be good and uh, you know as someone who has served his holiness for so many years and seen him you know campaign for people's kind of um, perspective on human nature to take compassion more seriously as a fundamental defining part of our nature. You know, you as a scientist have really worked very hard to promote this idea. And um, so my question is, um, you know, to what extent you think the scientific community is taking heed and taking serious note of this? And the other question is, what do you think would take to really make the paradigm switch so that, because in the end, I believe that, you know, the question of human nature has to do with how we see ourselves yeah. and the kind of story that we tell about who we are. Yeah. And the, if we do not include compassion or empathy, connectedness as part of that story, it has implications. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, you know, as a, 
a young scientist, it's been humbling to have the chance to spend time with Jimpa and His Holiness the Dalai Lama and other practitioners of, of wisdom. And, and they often start from such a different place than where science starts, which is survival is about a bloody and tooth and cloth competition. And Darwin didn't believe that. Uh, and if you go to Tibetan Buddhism, there are so many different views of the human mind as being fundamentally about cooperation and compassion. And I, and I think that there is a, a scientific revolution that is afoot, in part because through Mind in Life and other organizations, scientists are hearing about Tibetan monks who spend five hours a day training the mind and suddenly feeling compassion. So what we're seeing scientifically, I think, is nothing short of revolutionary, that our acts of charity and generosity, many in this room are interested in bringing that online, can, we can now document they have effects on other people and create altruism two or three interactions away from that original interaction. We're now starting to document with people like Steve Cole and Alyssa Eppel, whom we heard from earlier, there are genes in our genome that build up neurophysiological systems that are primarily about compassion, right? So here we see, I think, this, this thrilling um, convergence, if you will, uh, and, and uh, it's why Arturo is to be commended for bringing them into Facebook. It's a very exciting opportunity. Wonderful. Um, so somebody told me that there wasn't a word for emotion as such in <laughs> at Tibetan. So how do you reason about and communicate and teach about it all? <laughs> you mean about emotion? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, this is true, actually. Um, if you look at um, the classical Buddhist uh, understanding of human mind and mental processes and emotional processes, um, uh, it is true that we don't have a single technical term that um, translates the English word emotion. Um, and there has been some discussion about this, you know, because if you look at the contemplative practices, a lot of them are really aimed at bringing about some kind of emotion regulation and basic transformation in the way in which we would experience the world. But at the same time, this sophisticated, you know, kind of intellectual philosophical tradition does not have a single word for emotion. <laughs> and this really raises up interesting questions because, I mean, here, um, generally many um, uh, kind of, you know, scientists of language are beginning to realize that actually there is a big difference in the brain of unilingual lingual people on the one hand and people who are bilingual. And one of the interesting things is that in the uni those who are unilingual, generally because they know only one language, they tend to believe more in the reification of the word, sort of the meaning. So if you say just because there happens to be a word, they believe that the, 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 the thing that the word is referring to must really exist. So the same thing with emotion, but the, the looking more seriously, one of the things that I've come to recognize is perhaps the concept is there, but it is in a more diffused way. And one fundamental difference is that um, the Buddhist classical conception of mental processes, we don't really make this sharp dis divide between cognitive processes on the one hand and emotional affective processes on the other, because every mental event is really thought to have some feeling tone to it. They may be more cognitively pronounced, or they may be more effectively or emotionally pronounced, but every, even, a, a, an, even an intellectual thought, which may seem very neutral, will have a feeling tone. And that's probably the reason why emotion as a separate category is not recognized. And this may have more historical reason, because, if, for example, if you think, look at the Western thought, it goes all the way to the Greeks, you know, this distinction of the soul into three different components of passion and reason. That kind of sharp divide is already there in the early Greek thought. So this is more probably cultural, historical, and philosophical. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> so, Jimpa, I wanted to ask you, we, one of the things that we see is um, this, this attempt to bring the wisdom of mindfulness and the great contemplative traditions, Jack Kornfield, John Kabat-Zinn, and bring it into the new technologies. Um, and when I encounter uh, the practices and the disciplines and the habits of Tibetan Buddhists, it's a, it's a really dramatic challenge, right? Now, Meng has convinced me all you have to do is wish for kindness for two people and you change your DNA, and I think you're right. Um, but how, what is your 
wisdom about taking this very deep discipline and building it into the fast communication of Facebook and Google and the like? Um, this is actually a very um, challenging question because uh, as someone who has been brought up in a, a contemplative tradition and you know, I was actually, some of you may know that I was brought up as a monk and trained as a monk and I became a monk for a long time. Um, you know, we are used to uh, relating to transformational processes that presuppose that you are able to spend hours and hours in formal contemplative practice. But frankly, uh, if that is what is required for having real transformation, I think it's 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 a kind of a tall order to bring in the modern world. <laughs> but my own sense is that there are certain key insights in the, in the contemplative traditions, one of which is the importance of consciously setting your motivation. You know, this is setting intention. Yeah. For example, the Tibetan Lojong tradition emphasizes that, you know, two things are very important in every activity. We, one is, right at the beginning, setting the right intention. And at the end, when you finish it, to really rejoice in what you have done. And those kind of things are fairly simple to bring into whatever you do. You know, so if you constantly immediately check what is your intention and motivation for doing a particular act, yeah. that really changes you. Yeah. And then at the end of the act, if you can rejoice, most of the things that, we are, that are harmful, we know at the end we cannot rejoice in it. I mean, unless you are a psychopathic or something. <laughs> so, um, so by simply taking those kind of advice, it makes a huge difference. And then with respect to paying attention, you know, by simply by focusing on a breath. And I often tell people who are very interested in meditation, but they say, oh, I can't spend half an hour in silent meditation. I can't sit. I tell them, do five minutes. You know, five minutes is not too much to ask in the morning. Sit down switch off the t television or, or uh, uh, all the kind of distracting devices or get to a separate place. And five minutes starting with a deep breath and simply focusing on your breath and not expecting anything. Just be there. And then you can build up from five to 10 minutes and 10 to 15 minutes. And then the beauty of contemplative practice is that once you get a little bit of taste, you actually enjoy the experience. And then the, when the joy comes in, then it takes care of the motivation. So I think there are things like this which we can be much more creative in adapting in our very, very busy and crazy life. And, and then I actually agree with men. Simply <laughs> rejoicing, wishing happiness for two people you know, I mean, okay. actually what you were asking is also quite a lot. You are asking 10 seconds every hour. That <laughs> means you have to remember, unless you have a kind of a beeper or something. <laughs> so, uh, and, and that I think is, can be very powerful. Yeah. Um, so we're almost out of time, and so I have one more question. Um, so what is your intention with your life's work? Well, my intention is to really, um, as much as possible, draw from my own classical Buddhist training and insights and background and make an offering to the larger world to really help people, you know, develop their own good qualities and find ways in which they can deal with their suffering and actually accept suffering as part of one's life. Wonderful. To rely on science to make the world more compassionate. Um, I think for me it is to combine science and wisdom to the service of how people communicate and relate to each other. Um, and with that, I want to thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you this very has much. It's been amazing. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all.